Good morning. We thank you for joining with us on this beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it. To our church family and our visitors, we want you to know that it's your pleasure indeed to have you with us. And our heart is glad. We're looking at the scripture written according to the Gospel of Luke in the very first chapter. And I'll be reading to you from the New Revised Standard Version. We have, beginning at the 13th verse, through the 15th verse, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, or even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And down just a few more verses to the 30th verse, we will find that the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The word of God for the people of God. This is Mother's Day 2020. And I wish to say to all mothers, God's blessings upon you. You are a star wherever you are. Blessed Mother's Day. Mother's Day is considered the third highest church attendance Sunday. First is Christmas, second is Easter, and third is Mother's Day. This holiday carries an array of emotions, feelings, and behaviors. In fact, some would rather avoid this day altogether. It brings back thoughts and memories and grief of the mother who's passed on. Others have memories of abusive or dysfunctional home settings and there are some who never knew their mother as she passed at childbirth or when they were very young. And yet others were forced to give their child up for adoption. This is the day that many mothers struggle with the memories of death of their child or equally as devastating. They face the battle of infertility. Well, whatever your story, we all have one, bitter and sweet. Please know that God declares that he knows the plans that he has for us. He plans to prosper us and not to turn away all harm from us. He plans to give us hope and a future. Being a mother is the toughest human role in our society. This position is definitely not cut out for wimps or quitters. On a personal note, I see the pregnancy, along with the labor pains to the point of delivery, as simply a sneak preview of the reality to follow delivery. The title of the message this morning is My Mother, My Name. My Mother, My Name. God gives a mother the joy of life that tightens and strengthens her bond with her little one. She falls so in love with this precious soul, so much so that when reality comes, she's too locked into her role of mother to get out or to give up. Little do we know as mothers that the reality sets in at the beginning of infancy. And there we are as mothers asking what's too much and what's too little. And then they go into the teething stage and we're beginning to ask, when does teething begin and when does it end? And how can such a little person scream so loudly? And then we see the toddler stage. How fast can we actually move at a moment's notice? And how busy can little hands be? And then there's the terrible twos. What happened to the naps, we asked ourselves. Does the sky ever go to sleep? And then there's pre-K. This is when they learn bad habits from their little classmates. And of course, we see elementary school level, where they become competitive and selfish, and very talkative and playful. And in middle school, they're, they're seeking independence and their show-offs. And finally, high school, there are injuries and peer pressure and, and invitations to drug usage. Oh, finally, they're in college, 
They know it all at this point, but yet they're very indecisive. They aren't sure which degree they're wanting to pursue. And finally, they get their first real job. And they say they're not being paid what they're worth. They think they're being underpaid. And then there's the marriage, oh my gracious me. We're asking ourselves, can these couples stay together? Can this relationship last? And then there's the day when we become grandparents. Our children have children. And we ask the question, where did the time go? If only someone had told us sooner, we could have done a much better job at being a mother. My mother, my name. Motherhood is a great honor, and our society generates past, present, and future are indebted to us in one way or another, irregardless to the relationship you might have had with your mother or your mother with you. Everyone's indebted. All women have the capacity to mother directly or indirectly. Some have the role of mother that is manageable, and while others are spinning around and out of control. May we keep in mind that there are several types of mothers. There's a natural mother, and a foster mother, adopted mother, surrogate mother, stepmother, godmother. Then there's the church mother. And best of all, there's the grandmother. Thank God for the grandmother. As mentioned earlier, Mother's Day doesn't bring uh, the best memories to everyone, but everyone is indebted to their mothers. In fact, once a mother, always a mother. Dead or alive, we're a real mother. And that is an honorable position but it truly is the toughest task to perform. Did you know that whatever the expecting mother eats and thinks and feels and does and speaks during a pregnancy affects not only her baby's body, but the spirit as well? You can ask Mary and Elizabeth. When they came into each other's presence, there John the Baptist in the womb did his happy dance because he knew the Messiah was in the room. The tiny life of the unborn is sensitive and able to be influenced while they are in the room. There are times that God will give expecting mothers revelations about their body and or their baby. This experience is good to be shared with the father of the unborn. Discussing and praying about the revelation will ease the burden of becoming a new parent and will give a greater understanding to the will of God and the plan for the child. We all, from the time of conception, have preordained missions for our life, and how we are treated while in the womb can influence the outcome. Husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, and parents of the unborn should unite and ask for God's guidance in presenting the little one to the Lord, and also to ask how to care and to nurture. God gives life, to us, and he entrusts this life in our care. My mother, my name. According to a UK study, moms fill nearly 300 questions a day per child. There are little ones quizzing them around the clock. They ask more questions to mom than they do teachers, doctors, and nurses. According to Laura Menz, pediatric speech, language pathologist and author of Teach Me to Talk Toddlers begins to ask questions. They start asking questions when they're little. They can't even make sounds or words, but they ask with their eyes and their expressions the way they reach for objects. They ask the what's that question, beginning at 15 to 18 months. They ask the who and where questions between two and a half to three year olds. And the why and the how questions began at three to three and a half. Asking these questions give them answers to their curiosity and it helps them to grow and to develop. And mom gets most of the questions because dad is usually not around as often or as long. And the questions began with things like, mom, what are you doing? Mom, can you tell the dog to go so I don't hurt him? Mom, it's today Mother's Day. Mom, what's a compass? Mom, why are you doing that? And then around 15 years old, it becomes, Mom, can I invite a friend over? Mom, can you tell Ava to leave? I'm trying to watch a show. Mom, have you seen my phone? Mom, have you seen my phone? Mom, have you seen my phone? And this 
goes on quite a bit because they can't seem to keep track of their phone. And then it's, Mom, I can't find my phone. Mom, can I borrow your phone? Mom, she's bothering me again. Mother, mother, and my name. The older they get, the fewer questions they ask, the less they share, the less they actually talk. They have their friends, they have their smarter than mom cell phones. And they just don't ask any questions if they can't get it from Google. They ask their friends. In both instances, whether they're young or whether they're older, we're grateful to be mothers. It's an interesting position. I recall not long ago seeing a commercial on TV. And it seems that there was a young mother being fussy over leaving her baby with the babysitter for the first time. At least that's the connotation of the commercial. And towards the end of the commercial, it shows that this same mother, who's a little bit older, now has two little ones, and she's making less of a fuss over the second baby. She likes hands that throws the second baby into the sitter's hands. As I observe this commercial, on many occasions, I always ask myself, why was the mother less fussy over the second baby? Was it because the mother knew that it was not necessary to be as fussy this time around, having learned by trial and error with the first baby? Is she now a more experienced mother? Or was the mother confident that the sitter had enough experience in sitting for her and had everything under control? Or maybe the mother was not as concerned about either of the little ones, but was focusing on her appointment. There were several ways I could have interpreted that commercial. I say that to say that there are things that appear that may not be. And there are ways that we're seen as mothers. The question is, does the birthing order play an important part? The firstborn getting the best of everything? The secondborn getting the hand-me-downs? And the last being the youngest, getting whatever they want because there are not going to be any more babies? Ah, not so sure. Mother is the most powerful and honorable calling on the earth. And many of these lovely mothers have birthed in society, chemists, doctors, scientists, astronauts, machinists, mechanics, hunters, fishermen, nurses, politicians, and even presidents of the United States. All generations past, present, and future are indebted to their mother. Where do we usually make our first impact with our children, with our new babies? I would say that just maybe more important than the date of birth or the weight of the child, the name it stands out for most. Naming a child is really a big deal for most mothers. This label is most Cases will be with the child for the rest of his or her life, and the baby will come to know their name by the time they're five to seven months old. Laura Wattenberg, author of The Baby Name Wizard, states that when a child is born, the name reflects more on the parent, on the mother, than on the child. The name doesn't belong to you. You are making the decision because your child can't do it for himself. But what you choose does say a lot about your personality. If your child has an old-fashioned name, you're on the conservative side. If you've chosen Agnes or Homer or Tabitha or Ava or Emily. And if you choose a creative name, spelling, you just simply are saying you dare to be different. You insist on being different. So your name, you'll spell writer with a Y and Rocco with two Ks and Zoe with two E's. Many parents are taking a traditional name and putting their own spin on it by changing the spelling. So we see extra vowels and silent H's and Y's. If you choose a family name, you're sentimental, like Charlie or Vivian. This name has more of a personal story behind it. We're talking about my mother, my name. A pop culture name means you're looking for a confident boost. Our celebrity by the name of Mariah Carey named her little girl Monroe after Marilyn Monroe. And Lyman Gallia 
named his son Lennon after John Lennon of the Beatles. These are also celebrity watchers who name their babies celebrity names. If you name your child after destination, you're adventurous, like Egypt and Memphis and Brooklyn and Dakota and Dallas and London, Paris and Tijuana. It has been said that these names often have a lot of meaning for parents. It can be where they met, spent their honeymoon, or even where the child was conceived. These names also send out a signal to others that the parents are world travelers. Uh, and we should give these names to our babies. So, let's just look at our scripture, if you will. As we continue to address my mother and my name. We find in Genesis, in the beginning of the book, in the 16th chapter, and the 10th to the 11th verse, the angel of the Lord is speaking to Haggah. And he says, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, now you have conceived and shall bear a son, and you shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And in the next chapter, Genesis 17, God is now talking to Abram. And he says, your wife Sarah shall bear a son and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. That's an interesting take in the beginning of the book. We find that God is talking to the parent to be. And he's giving them the name that he has designed, as opposed to some of the list of, of name procedures or choices that I just spoke about. We find that God is telling Hagar to name her son Ishmael. He's telling Abraham to name their son Isaac. And the child's gender is already identified. God says, son, son. And then when we look into the New Testament writings, we're going to the Gospel according to Luke and the first chapter there. And we find that God now is speaking to Zechariah. And he tells him, do not be afraid, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Not only does he tell him he's going to name him John, he tells him why. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he's being consecrated, mind you, because the Lord says he must never drink wine or strong drink, even before his birth. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are there something special here? And then further down in the same chapter, to the 30th verse, we find there that the angel is speaking to Mary. And he tells her that God has given her favor. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Oh, it's wonderful to see God for all things particularly when God has given us the assignment of mother. When we're choosing a name, shall we first consider the gift giver of life? Can we consider God and checking with him to see what is best? Why have you given me this child and what position will he serve? What type of servant will he be and what name should I give? Oh, whatever name mother thinks is ideal and her little one will have to live with it. How many mothers have asked their child if they like their name? Or how many children have asked why they were given their name and what does it mean? Better yet, have you ever considered the impact the names will have among their siblings? Will they be teased? Will they be resented because one's named after dad and one's named after grandpa? Do you know how your child sees you as their mother? Our children see things differently, you know. Have you ever asked them? This is a nice little story I like to share with you. One little girl gave her point of 
be on retirement and senior living. And this is the story that she gave. It was dictated and put into a balance statement. She says, we always used to spend holidays and school breaks with my grandpa and my grandma. And they used to live here in a big brick house, but grandpa got wobbly and they moved to Florida. And now they live in a place with a lot of other wobbly people. And they all live in little tin boxes. And they ride three-wheel bicycles. And they all wear name tags because they don't know who they are. They go to a big building called a rec hall. But if it was wrecked, they got it fixed because it was all right when I saw it. They play games and they do exercises, but they don't do them very well. There's a swimming pool there. They go and get in it and they just stand there with their hats on. I guess they don't know how to swim. And as you go into their park, there's a dollhouse with a little man sitting in it. He watches all day so they can't get out without him seeing them. And when they can't sneak out, they go to the beach and pick up shells that they think are dollars. My grandma used to bake cookies and stuff, but I guess she forgot how. Nobody cooks. They just eat out. They eat the same thing every night, early birds. Some of the people are so wobbly, they don't know how to cook at all. So my grandma and grandpa bring food into the rec hall, and they just call it potluck. My grandma says grandpa worked all his life and earned his retirement. I wish I would have them to move back home. I guess the little man in the dollhouse won't let them out. But this is a child's view of what they see. And they see mom all the time. They have ideas of who we are. Today we ask all mothers how do you rate your performance as mother on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest possible score? And how do you think your child rates you by that same scale? Have you given them a name that defines you and what you are about? Or does it define your child and his purpose, his mission, his destiny, your hope or dream for his promising future? What name have you given? The name that you give represents you. It represents your thought and your mindset. Throughout the Bible, we find women who dealt with the challenges of motherhood. And it's interesting to know that, just like us, they were not perfect. Just like us, they learned by trial and error. Just like us, they did the very best based on what they knew. Let's look at Eve, the first mother. She faced the loss of two sons. The oldest son came, was overcome with the sinful emotions of jealousy and rage, and took the life of his younger brother Abel. And the oldest son came, was then forced to bear the mark of responsibility for his own sinful actions. He suffered unrest and a lack of inward peace for the remainder of his life. How painful for Eve. It was a lose-lose situation. She lost both sons. God gave her a third son, Seth, one who called on the name of the Lord. It did not erase the trauma that she had experienced, but it did ease some of her pain. Let's look at Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. She struggled with favoritism of her son Jacob over Esau. How can a mother bear to carry twins in her womb and love one more than the other? Her favorite son Jacob, through trickery, stole the birthrights of her older son Esau. And this led to a generational conflict between their descendant nations. If only she could have loved them both equally. I'm sure that some mothers are aware of both of these scenarios. Perhaps you have experienced a couple of your children just that always claw at each other. They're always in conflict with each other. And one will stay away if the other one shows up. And maybe 
We might have some similarities like Rebecca, where we like one more than the other. However, we might justify that. But then there's Jochebed, a caring mother. She was forced by the law of the land to give up her youngest son, Moses. It was such a hard decision for her to make. But rather than throw him into the river, as she had been commanded, she made a basket and put him on the river. And God, in his infinite power, directed the baby Moses to Pharaoh's daughter. Jochebed gets the best of two worlds when she's called to care for her son for Egyptian wages in the house of Pharaoh. She could not take her son home ever again, but she could influence and teach him about the God of Israel and to always remember his mother's teachings. Ah, and then there's Naomi, a woman who once knew the life at the highest peak of comfort and joy until her husband died and then her only two sons who had always been somewhat unhealthy. They died as well, leaving her alone and deeply depressed. She was bitter and angry and destitute. She came to know happiness again when her daughter-in-law, Ruth, married a kinsman redeemer, Boaz, and bore a son, and his name was Obed. What joy this brought to Naomi. Oh, as I look at Luke, the second chapter, I see another little boy. His name is Jesus. And it seems that in that second chapter in Luke, around the 41st verse, we find that Jesus has gone to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. And his family has partaken, and it's time that they leave, and they've traveled for a whole day. And then it dawns on them that Jesus is not in the crowd with the family. They've traveled a whole day, and Jesus is missing. Every mother knows the frantic response of looking around, and your child's not there. Oh, nothing is more nerving and panic than not to know where your child is. So they all decide, let's go back. We've got to go find Jesus. Jesus is 12 years old, mind you. He's still a child. So they make a reverse. They go back past their tracks and they're frantically looking for Jesus. And after looking in Jerusalem for three days, it takes them three long days. Can you imagine Mary's heart pounding? Every little fella she saw from the back of his head, she thought that was him and it wasn't. Can you imagine the agony, the frustration, can you imagine poor Joseph with her and the family? They're all on pins and needles. And finally, they find Jesus happily in the temple. Huh. They find their child is not in harm's way. And Mary says, we've been looking for you. Why did you do this to us? And you know how moms are. We're glad to see you. We want to kill you for leaving. <laughs> Interestingly, we want to choke you for taking us through all the little excitement. But she was so glad to see her son. And Jesus responds with an interesting thing for a 12 years old little fellow. He says, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand that. And so he willingly went home with his parents. And he willingly continued to obey them. But Mary continued to ponder what he had said. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? She thought on that as they returned home. And she thought on that and as she retired for bed. And she thought in the morning. And she's just trying to figure it all out because her son's unusual. Her son is a godson. He's 100% man and he's 100% God. And she has a unique son. And she's learning about him as he grows and develops, just like all mothers. All of our children, sons and daughters, are unique. They're designed for us to be their mother. And we're designed for them 
God has done a perfect arrangement in mothers and their children. May we pray, please. Bow our heads. Heavenly Father, the giver of all good and perfect gifts, the greatest of these is our mother. Thank you for the mothers who have loved us first and longest. Bless them for insisting on us living holy, pure, and blameless lives and the holy examples they have set before us. Forgive us for failing to fully honor and respect them during our younger years. Reward mothers everywhere for their continuous prayers that they pour out for their children. Please hear them and save their children from themselves and the bondage of their sinful lifestyles, which involves drugs, alcohol, gambling, pornography, and other lusts of the flesh. Heavenly Father, let these mothers never lose faith that someday their children will return to the fold, no matter how far they have gone into sin. For the sake of their holy mothers, draw the prodigal sons and daughters back to the foot of the cross by your spirit. Mary, who is highly favored of God, is the ideal mother. Help all mothers to imitate her humility, her faith, her purity, her modesty, her obedience, and her endurance. I ask this in the awesome name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And at this time, I would like to say once again, the best of Mother's Day to all the mothers. And may God the Father prepare your journey. Jesus the Son guide your footsteps. The Holy Spirit strengthen your body. And the three in one watch over you on your every road that you may travel and give you peace. Amen. Amen.